Hyvät kuulijat ja katsojat, lämpimästi tervetuloa Kymisinfonettan konsertin live-striimaukseen. Minä olen Riikka Luostarinen, orkesterin toimitusjohtaja, ja kutsunkin teidät nyt melkoiselle nojatuolimatkalle neljään eri maailman kolkkaa musiikin siivin. Samalla sukelletaan musiikin eri tyylilajeista, tunnelmista ja aihepiireistä toiseen. Matkamme alkaa riehakkaista merkeistä keittiöstä, jonne meidät johdattaa tsekkiläisen Bohuslav Martinuun keittiörevy. Padan ja kannen avioonnea uhkaavat vispilän ja astiapyyhkeen juonittelut kauniiden ja rohkeiden tapaan. Ja niin kuin joskus elämässä, kesken arjen touhujen mieleen saattavat nousta ihmisen ikuiset kysymykset elämästä ja olemassaolosta. Näitä kysymyksiä tutkiskelee amerikkalaisen Charles Ivesin hiljaisuudesta kumpuava kysymys vailla vastausta. Venäläissäveltäjä Galina Ustvolskajan syväluotaavaa oktettoa vie eteenpäin maaginen rytminen energia. Matkamme päättyy Meksikoon Silvestre Revueltasin Otsopon radioon, joka tarjoaa kahdeksan soittajan voimin mukaansa tempaavia rytmejä ja musiikillista huumoria. Konserttimme teosten esittelijöinä on kymisinfonetta muusikoita, joista osa on myös kotoisin esittelemänsä kappaleen synnöin maasta. Toivotankin nyt teille kaikille oikein mielenkiintoista ja nautinnollista musiikkimatkaa. Good evening. My name is Linda. I am the second concertmaster of Kumi Sinfonietta and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to celebrate tonight the diversity of different cultures um, that we will be hearing tonight. La Revue de Cuisine, or in other words in English it would be uh, the Revue of the Kitchen, was composed in 1927 by Czech composer Bohuslav Martinou and it was as a uh, commission work from a dramatic dance uh, company in Prague. The ballet is uh, composed in 10 movements and it originally is composed for six instruments exactly the way we will be performing it tonight. So for violin, cello, trumpet, bassoon, clarinet and piano. Even though Bogoslav Martinou spent the uh, last two decades of his life in exile, both in France and the United States. He is one of the most fruitful composers of the 20th century. This piece, The Kitchen Review, is a very progressive and colorful work, and it incorporates many aspects and trends of that time. Martinou himself was very keen and influenced and attracted to music uh, of Stravinsky and Debussy. Uh, one can see a lot of influence of jazz music in this piece. Um, there are uh, uh, rich harmonies and dissonances, especially in piano part. Uh, lots of muted trumpets, also lots of uh, pizzicatos used in a cello part, those all effects are echoing the jazz bands at that, in that er era. And also, of course, he uses a lot of Czech folk tunes, uh, folk-like melodies, those were very dear to his heart. The storyline of this piece is, is just ridiculous. It's uh, amorous intrigues among the cooking utensils which swagger their life through the kitchen. So the pot and lid are married, but their marriage is very threatened by the trailing stick. The pot is himself, um, allows himself to be seduced and throws the lid off. The dishcloth, meanwhile, has an eye on the lid, but is challenged to a duel with the broom. Long story short, duel ends rather traumatic, um, but the pot understands his big mistake of leaving the lid. 
but the lid has no has no place to be found. Is she missing? Will she come back? Drama. Nevertheless, the story ends happy and happy for everyone. The lid comes back, the pot and the lid are happily together. The dishcloth goes off with a twirling stick and the broom, well, the broom is finally happy that there is a total order around. So please join us for the moment of fantasy, naiveness, paradox, fun, dance, and even some drama. Welcome, and we hope you will enjoy.
Next we'll be hearing Charles Ives, The Unanswered Question. Charles Ives was an American composer um, who was extremely unconventional um, and a lot of this was because his father exposed him to a lot of experimental musical ideas when he was very young and they have a very large effect on his music later in his life. He was also influenced by the Transcendentalist movement in the United States which is a philosophical movement and that also features heavily in this piece. The unanswered question uh, refers to the structure of the piece in which the trumpet of this chamber ensemble asks a question, a very basic question about the existence of life in general. And he's answered every time by the woodwind quartet, the second group. Um, and this question is asked again and again. Um, there is um, a cr increasing agitation throughout uh, the piece every time the question is asked and every time an answer is given. And finally, at the end, when it seems like there is no uh, resolution, the question is asked once last, one last time by the trumpet, and it is left unanswered. And behind uh, this entire dialogue, there is uh, a string quartet who's playing um, a much more uh, universal background, um, sort of the ethereal uh, uh, character um, as a setting for these two other voices. Um, a unique feature about this piece of music is that uh, these three groups operate independently, um, which was almost unheard of at the time. Um, they don't actually communicate to one another and they are instructed not to play together. So you don't hear the three groups um, working as a team, rather you hear three completely independent voices. And the unique part about this is that the piece can never be played the exact same way twice, uh, because it all depends on the moment and how the different players are reacting to one another without being able to hear or see one another. Um, we hope you enjoy it.
Greetings. My name is Sergei. I am the second violin leader of Kumi Sinfonieta Orchestra. And uh, we are going to perform uh, an octet of uh, Soviet Russian composer Galina Ustvolskaya. And now I'm going to uh, tell something about this composer and about this music. Uh, Galina Ustvolskaya was living in uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg, for her entire life. Another strong influence on her personality and style was uh, the fact that she was a student of Dmitry Shostakovich. She was one of the most remarkable students and uh, he was estimating her very high. Uh, and when this particular octet has been premiered in 1970, uh, it was a concert of, uh, of young composers in Leningrad, uh, chamber music concert. And this piece has been standing in the end of the first half of the concert. And Shostakovich, as uh, composer number one in the city and in the country, uh, of course, uh, he had to, to be present and to listen to everything. And uh, after he has listened, he was so impressed and amazed that uh, he hasn't been able to listen the second half of the concert and just went home. But uh, relations between teachers, uh, between teacher and student were not very simple. Shostakovich has had very strong charisma and uh, magnetism that were attracting uh, the young composers and his students uh, so much that uh, they were trying to follow him and to repeat after him, continuing his style. But uh, that didn't work like that with Galina Ostvolska, uh, whose style and aesthetic was rather much about negation, very negative music, that music that is saying no to, to her teacher, to the power of the country, to the entire world, actually. It's much more than just political disagreement or aesthetic disagreement. Uh, and that is the main point of her style. Uh, as we can see in this octet, we have four violins, uh, two oboes, piano and timpani. Combination of instruments that nobody has used before or after. Which is very typical for Galina Ustvolska because there were, for example, pieces for piccolo flute and tuba and piano, eight double basses. Uh, that, is, that is a pure protest. That is a pure protest against the way how world is designed, how, how music has been designed before. She is not trying to follow the traditions. She is trying to, to find some sounding of the instruments that uh, hasn't been used before. In this octet, we can see that uh, we can't find the, the usual structure for violin, the usual structure for oboe or piano. Uh, violin doesn't sound like a violin, oboe doesn't sound like an oboe. Neither do piano or percussion. It all sounds together uh, as something supernatural, mysterious. Uh, it's really hard to to find the exact words, it's uh, much easier to say and to understand when we listen. And uh, we would like to introduce you to this music.
Hello, I'm Dimas. I play oboe in Kumi Sinfonietta, and I'm here to talk about Ocho por Radio, a um, piece by Mexican composer Silvestre Revueltas, which will be the last piece in this program. This piece is really fresh. I think fresh is the best way to describe it. And so was Revueltas for his own country, for his own musical panorama. He lived in the first half of the 20th century, was born in Mexico, in the state of Durango, spent some part of his life in the U.S., which uh, had a big influence, influence in him. He opened the scope of his musical, musical ambitions and, and knowledge. And when he was back to his country, he fought really hard to, to get the musical life renovated, modernized. So he was active in the creation of the National Symphony Orchestra together with Carlos Chavez and then he was also um, assistant teacher and, and director at the conservatory. And he started from the very beginning also when he began to compose to be active with um, music for films. For instance, a documentary called Redes was his first piece of international re relevance and also radio music. And this is one of those pieces he wrote for radio. The piece was commissioned by the, the Office for Public Education Orchestra, which those days had eight members. And those are the members who play in this, in this piece, and that's why it's called Ocho, so eight. Eight by radio, Ocho por radio. Mm, Revueltas writes some A, B, A shape piece, so we have a, a very happy, festive beginning, really rhythmical, and then we have a beautiful slow part in the middle with this suggestive sonority of an Indian drum. He writes Indian drums or something deep. And in the end, this festive atmosphere comes back. It's really easy to listen to, and it reminds a lot from a, another piece I really recommend you to listen by Copland, El Salón, Mexico. Copland was a good friend of Revueltas. He was asking for help from him at some difficult points in his life. And he had other important acquaintances also in the U.S. musical life. For instance, when this piece was performed in New York, uh, Edgar Varese was uh, writing himself to congratulate and to explain how big a success this was in the, in the concert. But before we listen to it, I, I read for you a translation of Revueltas' own comments about his own piece. And you can sense how ironic he was and, and how, how fresh, in a way. He, he's really this kind of renovating character. The piece is an algebraic dilemma without possible solution unless you possess deep mathematical knowledge. The composer has tried to solve it by using musical instruments, succeeded just to some extent. Critics, well acquainted with the number issues, can judge with their usual equanimity. Hope you like this piece as much as I do. <laughs> 